Alors, tu vas aller si euh, je vais donner un All right, everybody. Should we continue looking Allez, on y va. Should we start? Yeah, let's go. All right. All right, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Oui. Good? No, not yet? All right. Cool. Uh, we'll start, and then whenever other people show up, we'll catch them up um, in, in a quick way so that everybody can be brought up to speed if other people show up. If not, we're, we're good and we're exactly where we need to be. So, as always, first thing first uh, for the housekeeping, we need to do any brachot for anybody that's uh, passed away and for anybody that is sick. So first we'll do for Refua Shlema. Everybody could just say names of people that are sick. We'll do the class in their name. Um, I'll start Yermia Yermia Abraham Ben Soda. May Hashem give all of them a refua shema, refua tenefesh, refua taguf, el na refan alem, el na refun alem, el na refan alem. Refua. Also, yeah, throw in refua. Eli, Ben, Marcel, Michal. Amen. 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 Refua shema, na na refan alem. Next, um, let's do for the Aliyah Neshamat of the people that have passed away in the last year, or for those in general. And we can do the class in their name as well. Gabriel Ben Margalit. Gabriel Ben Margalit. Odette, la maman de Rabanit Esther Ifra. Odette. Odette Batsara. Odette Batsara. And ceux qui sont morts juste maintenant là. Yeah, and for all the people that are, are dealing with sickness and that have passed away because of the viruses and the illness, illnesses that exist in the world, may Hashem give their neshamot aliyot. Amen. 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 So, Amen. we're going to talk about Parashat Chai Sarah, and as usual, I'm just going to start off by sharing the ideas and the topics that we're going to go over tonight, and then after that, we'll get into it. Um, so, we're going to talk tonight about the idea of Ratzon, the will that a person has, the, the envy that you have to want to be able to get closer to Hashem. We're going to talk about Hid Bodedut, which is uh, something that's very big in Breslev Chasidut, which is essentially secluded meditation. We're going to also talk about Hid Chadshut, which is the concept of renewing yourself. And we're going to talk about a lesson in Likute Maran, and that's lesson 12 in book 2. It's the lesson that talks about Aye, Aye Makom Kavadol Arizo. So we're going to jump into a lot of different ideas. I'm going to try to unify all of them. And I'm going to try to throw in a little anecdote also for Sarah and talk about some stuff in regards to women as well, because this is specifically the parasha that's named after a woman. It's the only parasha that's named after a woman. The other five are named after men. Um, and uh, the ones that have names in their parashiot. And specifically, there's a lot of deep secrets in this class and, and a lot of things that are connected specifically with women and, and the beauty that falls throughout this class. So to be able to start first, just a basic overview of the parasha. And, uh, and the stuff that goes through it, we pick up in last week's parasha by the Akedah Titzchak. So Avram goes to the Akedah. Um, the path that I'm going to take tonight is going to go more on the mystical side. So if there are questions for stuff, we'll literally start and we'll just... Uh, oh, perfect timing. Chazak <laughs> What's up? Bochim Abayim? Grab a seat, grab a seat. We literally just got started. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, sure. Samuel, Louis, you want something? Come here, I'm, I move there. I'm so je les laisse là. Little intermission. I'm gonna have to cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> Shalom, shalom. Yeah, there's an empty glass over here. Celui-là, il est nickel. Tu peux le prendre. Ouais. Ça, je peux pas attendre. You are around. That's the thing. Le chaim, le chaim, le chaim. Le chaim tout bien. Hazak ou baour. Louis, un petit verre de vin. Ouais. 
All right, guys, we literally just got started so that you guys didn't miss anything. You walked in perfect timing. We're talking about Parashat Chaye Sarah. We're going to talk about the will of man. We're going to talk about Ratzon. We're going to talk about Hizbozidut. All right, guys, we're going to talk about... Right, I'm going to get going, otherwise we'll, yeah. we'll, otherwise we'll never get started tonight. We're going to talk about, like I said, we're going to talk about Ratzon, we're going to talk about Hidbodedut, we're going to talk about Hidchadshut, uh, which is the renewing, and we're also going to talk about Aye, right? Finding Hashem. So, a little bit of the backstory on the parasha of the week, so that people understand the, the context of what we're going to be talking about tonight, and then we're going to get into a little bit of the mysticism, and we're going to get into the Zohar, the Arizal, and obviously a little bit of Rabbi Nachman on the parasha of the week. So, what happened was, is that after Avraham did the Akedah, right, which was the sacrificing of Yitzchak in the parasha, I said I'm going to take the route that is covered by the Zohar. So, there's lots of different interpretations a lot of people obviously know if, they, if they've picked up a little bit of Torah that they know that there's a concept that's called Shivim Panim La Torah. There's 70 faces to the Torah. There's different interpretations to what happens in different stories in the Torah. And so the Zohar goes through a route in the parasha and part of the story that a lot of people are probably not aware of. But I want to start it off with that note because it'll help set the groundwork for people understanding what actually happened with all of the, the sequences that happened over here. So... And I'm not going to go into the actual Zohar. Unfortunately, we could do it maybe another time. But for right now, I'm just going to explain what the Zohar says on a very basic level. The Zohar says that when Avram did the Akedat Yitzchak, Yitzchak actually passed away. Okay, so most people think that Avram did the Akedat. The Midrash says that he, he um, hesitated. Um, Sarah saw what happened with uh, the Akedat. She saw that her husband, was, Avram, was going to do the Akedat. She passed away um, from the whole situation. And then Avram didn't end up doing it. He did a korban instead. And then he brought Yitzchak back home, right? But there's a lot of examples that are brought down and there's a lot of interpretation. There's a lot of Midrashim and the Zohar itself specifically goes through the route that Yitzchak actually did die on the mountain. He eventually comes back exactly three years later. And the Zohar says that when he died immediately on that moment, the Neshama Vrifka came into the world, who is going to marry. Because if you realize three years later when he comes into the world, he eventually comes back into the world to meet Rivka, and Rivka is three when he meets her. And that's when they're able to do the zivu, and that they're able to meet after. But I just want to lay that as the foundation for where we're going to go. If we have questions on the Zohar and stuff like that, maybe we could take it after. But for right now, understand that I'm going to go based on the concept that Yitzchak, according to the Kabbalah, passed away at Haramoya when he did the Akedah. Okay? We're going to go into the details of it, and we're going to do all that stuff a little bit later. After... He does that. He eventually comes down the mountain. He looks for another, um, he looks for a lamb to be able to do another um, korban, to be able to say thank you to Hashem for the opportunity to be able to do the mitzvot and goes home and sees that Sarah is dead. Okay. After he sees that Sarah passed away, he then goes to Hebron, which is nearby. And he starts looking and there's the whole story with Efron and how he starts looking to buy Marat Amarpela to be able to buy the burial plot where he's going to bury Sarah. And so that is kind of the background. And we're going to go into the details of Sarah's life, the 127 of Sarah, why it says it as 127. And we're going to go into a lot of the details of what happens in the Midrashim with the Akedat Yitzchak. And also at the very end, what happens with the deal with Efron, because there's a lot of amazing mystical things that happen there. And all of it will be brought back into a, pr a practical sense of what we're doing today. So like I usually do in a lot of these classes, to be able to actually go into the parasha and understand the depth of the parasha, we actually need to start off with some preliminary things first. So in the very beginning, to be able to understand what happened in the parasha, I need to do a couple things in advance. First, I need to introduce what essentially, which essentially was the first creation of the world. So essentially, what did Hashem create as the first thing when He created the world, or before He created the world? What was the first thing that Hashem created in general? Does anybody know? Light. That's in the Torah. And the light is not a physical light because that happened on the third day, but that's just the light which is considered the Or HaGanuz, which is the light of the Tzadikim that are able to see, which is the light of Hashem. But before the Torah and before the world, it says that the, to that the world existed for, two the Torah existed 2,000 years, which is a concept of time even in the upper worlds, 
before the Torah was given and before the world was, was created. So what happened before all of that, before he created the Torah, which was before the world was created, before the Neshamot of the Tzadikim, before all of this? So the Kabbalah explains that the first thing Hashem did is, is he created a will. He created a Ratzon. Why? Because Hashem, because he's everything, and we're not going to go into the whole concept of what happened before the creation of the world, but if Hashem is everything and he encompasses everything, then how can it be that Hashem does something for someone else? Or even if we go into the concepts of he wanted to be able to give and he wanted to be able to create a world that he can do chesed and stuff like that, he still needs to create that ratzon. And so the first thing he did and the first thing Hashem did was he created for himself a ratzon to want to bring about the world and to bring about the Torah and the mitzvot and the tzaddikim and, the, and everything that was going to play out in the future. So the first thing Hashem did was create ratzon, which is fascinating because it shows you how elevated the concept of ratzon is. And the fact that Ratzon is so elevated, Adam Arishon, it says in the Midrash, was walking in Eden after, after the sin in Gan Eden, after, after the sin had occurred. And he was essentially seeing that there was no, nothing to eat, there was nothing. In, until after the Mabul, no one was able to eat animals. So before then, it was only eating vegetation. But the vegetation was not birthed yet because it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been brought into the world yet because there was no will for it. So what happened was, is as Adam was walking through Eden, the Midrash explains that Adam found a seed that Hashem gave him. And he said to Hashem, I'm going to put this seed in the earth because according to the Kabbalah, Adam was created from earth. And he said, if you can birth from earth and you can create man and you can create all of creation, therefore, I'm going to give you all of my ratan. I'm going to give you all my will and all of my muna. I'm going to put the seed of life into the earth and I'm going to let you birth whatever food I can take. And from there, Hashem took so much love from this aspect of Ratzon, of the will and the faith of Adam. He said, from now on until the end of time, all of that will grow from the earth is because of this seed. Because if you think about it in principle, the whole nature of the world exists that we can now grow things from the earth. But in principle, if you're walking the earth for the first time and you have no chokhmah or no emunah or no understanding of the world whatsoever, you would never know to be able to put a seed in the earth that you're gonna, it's something is gonna grow from it. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. But Adam created that will. And that will allowed for the nature of the world to be able to do. This was also in the worlds and the concepts before the world was that we actually inhabit and that we live in now. There's a couple other concepts that we need to go through before we go into the parasha as well. And one of them is the secrets behind the alphabet, right? So when Hashem, before he created the world, he created the Torah a couple thousand years before. And before he did that, he created the alphabet. So the Midrash and the Kabbalah also explain that Hashem started off with the letter Aleph. And he originally only wanted to do a world with the letter Aleph. It could have been a world where it would have been only people communication through meditations. It could have been stuff where there was only one need for one letter. And that one letter could have shaped and formed other communications. So we don't understand this, but this is what the Midrash explains. If you look at the letter Aleph, the letter Aleph is made up of a Yud, a Vav, and then another Yud. And he created the letter Aleph within his name and his image. And if you look at that, the Yud is 10, the bottom Yud is 10, and the Vav is 6, that makes 26. So already with the name of Hashem, you could see it in the first letter of the alphabet. So the first letter was created like this. After that, the, a letter appeared, as it says in the Midrash, and this is only Midrash, so that people understand. The letter Bet appeared, and it says, Hashem, I want to glorify the world through you. Just like every letter that Hashem made, just that so he made the Aleph to glorify the world through him. I want to glorify you as well, so make the world through me. And Hashem said, okay, and he made a good argument. And then Gimel came and then did the same thing and made an argument all the way until Shin. And after Shin was accepted, there was an interesting question that was brought down and said, you know, why do we have all the way until Taf? Why do we have an alphabet that has 22 letters and then the, you know, the five, six letters that are the ending letters? Why does that even happen? When Taf came to Hashem and popped up and it said to Hashem, I want to be also and I want to fill the world with your kabot. But it says in the Midrash, that Hashem said no, because then there'll never be an end. So what happened is that the, the letter Taf went and created 400 worlds of longing to Hashem. And in those worlds of longing, it said to Hashem, all I want to do is exist to be able to bring your kavod into the world. We know that the letter Taf is also for the letter of Torah. It starts off the word Torah. And after Hashem saw all the longing for the 400 worlds, it gave it the value 400. And that's how all this stuff is connected and each letter has a numerical value and all that different type of stuff. To show you how some of the chokhmah exists within the other letters that don't exist in other languages, just to show you how divine the Hebrew language is, there's lots of letters in the Hebrew alphabet that have secrets within themselves. Like for example, like I said, the Aleph has the Yud, the Vav, and the Yud. Chaf, if, when you learn Safrut, if you learn the Alachot of Safrut in Shulchan Aruch, 
it tells you how to draw specific letters. So the way, for example, you draw a lamed in Shulchan Aruch is it says you make a chaf and then you put a vav on top of it. And that's actually how it looks. It looks like a chaf and then there's a vav and that's how it makes a lamed. If you count it, also numerical value of chaf is 20 and the vav is 6. It's 26 as well. Mem, mm -hmm. they teach you also, is a chaf with a vav on the side that's connected. And so you're connecting the 20 and the 6. So there's lots of different things like this that happen. There's another beautiful chidush that I saw that explains a lot of the secrets. This is only very the face value of it. You can go for hours just on this. But if you look at the only letter that's closed in Hebrew, Sagur, is the Samech of the basic letters, not the ending letters, because it originally started with the basic letters. If you look at the letter after Samech, right, you have Ayin. And Ayin is a reference to eyes, as we say, Enayim. And then after Ayin, you have Peh, which is a reference to your mouth. And after that, you have Tzadik. So if you close your eyes and you close your mouth, you can become a tzaddik. That doesn't exist in other languages. So all of that is to set the foundation for, for the concept of, uh, of the alphabet. <laughs> it would be a much shorter class if we just stopped there, that, let me tell you. I'll try to speed it up also. So Rabbi Natan comes in and he says that there's four building blocks in the world and you're going to have to understand the four building blocks because without understanding the four building blocks, we're not going to understand parts of the parasha. So to go very quickly, obviously we know that there's four different worlds. Um, there's four different levels to the neshama. We don't usually talk about the upper, the fifth levels because they're things that are detached. They're things that are unattainable. Um, we know that there's lots of connections with the number four and the number four, 440, all of it's going to repeat. Like if you look at, for example, 40 days of the flood, 40 days going up to the mountain, um, Esav sent 400, um, uh, what's it called? People from the army to be able to go, you know, argue against Yaakov, which is going to come up in a few parashiot. All this years. type of stuff, exactly 400 years for the Galut. There's also um, the 40 years before a child is born, the things that the... the for David, the the garden, yes, the it's, it's literally endless. And mm -hmm. so the point is that he tells you that one of the foundations that we have in the world is to understand the concept of four. Also, you have the Yud, He, Vav, and He of Hashem, which is the four. Lots of God's names have four letters, the name of Adnut, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, and Yud, from the level of Malchut, from the lowest levels. Um, and from the highest levels of Keter is Aleph, He, Yud, and He, which is Ekie, which is the name of Hashem of the future. Um, all of that is very important. He then says that... Since the beginning of time, and this is another concept that we have to understand, tzaddikim and people have tried to find the best way to worship Hashem. And this is all going to connect to Avraham in a bit. So if you look at the stories from the Torah to David Amelar, to the Shoftim, to the Nevi'im, to the Ketuvim, to the rabbis that lived in the time of the Gemara, to even the tzaddikim that came way after, even the tzaddikim in our generation, there's so many questions of what is the best way to worship Hashem. And all of them boil down to two different ways. It's either a measure of heart or a measure of mind and the brain. And everything is broken down based on that. So for example, a person will say, you know, I wanna go pray in a shul. Um, so when you do the tefillah, a lot of people might take the approach of saying, well, no, you need to learn all the halachot, you need to understand how to do the tefillah, then once you understand all this stuff, then once you develop a chokhmah for understanding how to do a mitzvah, then you're gonna attain the highest level of the mitzvah. Then there's other people that take a route that's maybe a little bit more of a Hasidic route, and they'll say, you know what, just, just pray, do you, do however you feel. Open up a book and however you wanna speak, just speak, and just start from there. And they put more of an emphasis of using your heart than using your mind. And this machloket, it's not to say that one is necessarily more important than the other, but in circumstance, it does get more important. But no matter what, everybody who argues it says that there's value for both of them and you need to have both of them. It's just a question of how you pull the levers to put more value on using your chokhmah in situations or using your lev and doing things more emotionally or more interactively with Hashem. Similarly, in the same lesson, and in Likut Alachot, Rabbi Natan explains, and he says that there's two letters in the alphabet, because I want to connect it back to the letters, that are exactly the same, except one is upside down version of the other. And what he says is that it's the Nun and the Dalit. If you guys remember, I gave a class, and some of us were here, some of us were not, but just in short, funny enough, the month of Cheshvan that we were talking about, which is the month that we're in, which this parasha always falls out in, we said that the month of Cheshvan is symbolized by the Nun and the Dalit. But now I'm going to connect it more to the Chokhmah, and to using your heart. But just for some people that want to understand, the month of Cheshvan, every month in the Torah, just to show you how everything is kind of connected, 
We have 12 months of the year corresponding to the 12 tribes, corresponding to different variations of the alphabet. And so each time when a person is born, this is why in the Torah we believe in astro astrological signs and when people are born, is because depending on how a person may line up the solar system and the astrological spheres when a person is being born, depending on how stars, um, time of day, all that stuff, it affects the type of test, the name, the person's going to have all this stuff. So that's very important to understand. And the month of Cheshvan, that's all about rising above your base nature and achieving greatness from nothingness, from bitterness adding sweetness, right? Because it's Mar Cheshvan, but if you flip the letters Mar, you have Ram, which is to go above and beyond. And so over here, Rabbi Natan explains that there's the Nun and the Dalet. The Nun, if you look at it, it's a very small part on the top and the bottom has its base. In the Safrut, I'd be able to explain it a little bit better, but that's kind of the basic idea. The Dalet is the same except the opposite. It has the top base very heavy and it has the smaller part on the bottom. And it's exactly the same form according to the way that it's written, flipped. The reason for this is because essentially one of them is pulling from a heavier outlook in this world versus a heavier outlook in the concept of being able to connect to Hashem in the upper worlds. The Nun, if you look at its base, it's heavily rooted on the bottom. That's where its base is. It's, it holds strong on the bottom. And so that's why the Nun is also the 50 gates. We have 50 gates of Bina. Nun is Gematria 50, and it corresponds to Chokhmah. The Daled puts very little emphasis on the bottom, but it says I'm pointing everything and I'm putting all my weight upstairs, meaning that I'm going to look up to Hashem. Okay? We'll put pause on that and we'll come back to the Nun and Dalit in a minute. There's a beautiful Midrash that's brought down. And like I said, we're almost going to get to the Parasha, but this is just to be able to lay the groundwork. There's a Midrash that's brought down that says that in the beginning of time, Hashem planted grapes. And when the Mashiach comes, after Tchayat Ametim, Hashem is going to have a Seuda and He's going to open up the wine from when He planted from the beginning of time of creation for the Tzadikim. And everybody's going to be at the, at the Seuda. So there's going to be Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. And at the end of the Seuda, of glorifying Hashem and the Tzadikim and everyone, Hashem is going to prepare the Birkat Amazon. We're going to say thank you. And he's going to fill up a glass of wine and he's going to hand the cup of wine to Avram. And he's going to say, please do the Zimun. Because Avram was the first one to find Hashem. And Avraham, in the Midrash, it says, Hashem, I cannot accept to do the Zimun, to do the Bracha. Why? Because I brought Ishmael into the world and I brought Tzern and Tuma into the world. And then he passes it, he says, give it to Yitzchak. So Yitzchak takes it and Yitzchak says, sorry, I also brought Esav into the world. And then he keeps on going down and every single person has something negative that they brought to the table. Until at the very end of the table, someone with red hair puts his hand out and says, Hashem, give me the cup, I'll do it. <laughs> and who is that? David HaMelech. So the Zohar and the Kabbalah ask a question. Why doesn't David keep quiet like everyone else? How does, what gives David the right to take the cup and do the cup, do the koshel bracha essentially, which, and the Kabbalah is amazing on the koshel bracha. Even if you're by yourself, even if you're a solo person, it says that you should even do koshel bracha. If you're three people, 10 people, um, it, if you're 10 people, it's practically an obligation at that point. But it's so powerful to sit down and do the cup of wine after you eat bread. It's, it's an amazing thing. But without getting into that, what gives David the, the, the ability to be able to stand up and do the kosher bracha? So that to understand that, we have to go back to the Nun and the Dalet and understand the concept of Ratzon. Right? So whenever you act in a way that you depend on your Chochmah and you depend on your intelligence, everything that you do from your mind you always will fall short in the eyes of Hashem. Because in reality, nobody can be perfect in this world. We're human beings. We're made of flesh, we're made of blood. We have evil temptations, no matter what. Even Sadiqim have it. And so Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov and everyone else that studied Torah, that understood the Torah, that went into the Torah and lived by the Torah, even with Emunah and even with all the other practices, they had Chochmah that they had gained, that they lived by. The highest levels of the Chochmah, in fact. But in that Chochmah, because you fall short of Hashem, you always have some Tum'ah that you're not ready to be able to do the Kiddush. So you have to be a Nav and you have to decline. But David HaMelech, since the very time he was born, made himself like nothing. He made himself like zero. 
In fact, David Amelach was supposed to actually not even live. He was supposed to die right when he was born. We know from the Midrash that Adam Rishon gave 70 years of his life early. Adam was supposed to live 1,000. He lived 930 and he gave 70 to David Amelach. And David Amelach, since he was born, his whole life, he was the last of the sons. He didn't want to accept the kingship. He was chased out. His son wanted to kill him. The story with Bathsheba, the ridicule. Every, every story of David Amelach, you see him making himself like absolute nothingness. It's not that the other ones were not enough. They were all enough, but he perfected it. He perfected it to a level that no one else did. And so what David Amelach did is something very fascinating, which we should learn from. It's going to be the first takeaway of the class with Ratzon. David Amelach said, in front of you, Hashem, I want you to understand from the very minute I'm born, I'm zero which means that I'm going to be 100% of zero, which is zero. Which means, to take it a step further, that everything you give me, if you give me bracha, fantastic, it's you, I recognize it's you. If you give me a problem in my life, it's you too. So take it away, whatever it is, I'm going to bother you about it. I'm going to tell you, give me things because it's not mine and I need your help. And if you give me something bad, take it away because it's not mine either. So David is all about nothingness. And when David enters into nothingness and has a will to get close to Hashem, then what happens according to the Midrash? He has the right to stand up and say, give me the cup, the, the cup of wine, the kos. Why? Because at this point now, he reached 100% of nothingness. And he has the right to now do the Kiddush. Because he perfected this. Okay? Is everybody clear on all of that so far? Any questions so far? Okay. You're definitely a speed reader. <laughs> I'm only a, I'm only a little bit. <laughs> so, Rabbi Nachman says that if you do this, if you do this concept of what David Melach explains in this midrash, what we learn from David Melach in this midrash, you actually, you can achieve something that nobody else can achieve. And I'm not going to go so much into the concepts of what it's like to attach yourself to a tzaddik, but people that know this and have learned this, and when you attach yourself to tzaddikim, the tzaddikim can help you after they pass away. So whenever you get to the concept of understanding that all of your will and everything you do that is coming from Hashem, essentially, then you can reach a place where you can receive all the bracha, and after 120 years, you're immediately brought up to the highest places in the world. Because even your averot, according to the Kabbalah, cannot be given to you because you say that nothing is yours. So all your averot are essentially taken away. But your mitzvot stay because you acquire them through the kavod of Hashem. So this is the level of tzaddikim, and this is why Rabbi Nachman says a very big sugula to learn this from David Melach. And we learn this also back to connecting of the letters because the letter Taf, if you remember, the letter Taf created 400 worlds of Ratzon and had so much envy of wanting to get close to Hashem to bring the Kavod into the world of Hashem that the Taf was the last letter and Hashem said, we'll stop at that. And David Melech understood that. And so when you understand this, you're able to be able to do that. And all really all the stories of Rabbi Nachman and why Rabbi Nachman came into this world is he teaches people to not give up hope. Okay? There's a very famous story of Rabbi Nachman um, that I'd like to share at this point just because I think it makes sense and, and I think it'll help clarify some stuff about Ratzon. Before Rabbi Nachman came into the world, the Yetzer Hara went up to Hashem and told Hashem the Satan essentially went up to Hashem and he said, I know that you're going to bring down this Neshama into the world, but you can't do that because all that he stands for is giving people faith. He essentially regained faith. In fact, when Rabbi Nachman came into this world around the age of four or five years old, I said in the last class, he said, all the stories of tzaddikim and all the miracles, he said, I'm going to bring back every single Jew without stories of miracles, but only by simple faith, only by simple emuna. And people know, obviously, wondrous stories of Rabbi Nachman, but the greatest stories that we don't even really share about the tzaddikim and their stories of their miracles are the stories that show the simple faith of a Jew. The simple faith that a Jew understands that I want to bring Hashem into every aspect of my life. And that's where you actually see the, mir the miracles. It's in the hidden moments. And we're going to get into the hidden moments in a bit. Because it's a miracle itself. Yes. Because if you live that way and you live like Avram, like Avram that exited out of, the, out of the cave at the age of three years old and he walks outside for the first time and he sees that everything that exists into the world, when you see a tree for the first time, when you see a house for the first time, when you see the sky for the first time, everything for you is a miracle at this point. So there's no difference between what Hashem created and what man created because for you, you just see Hashem's glory everywhere. And that's where we have to get to the point of. And so Rabbi Nachman said that before his neshama came into the world, all the tzaddikim were getting ready because we were going to have the final 
massive tzaddik that was going to come into the world before the time of the Mashiach. And we needed this preparation. And finally, Hashem allowed for it to be able to come down. The Yetzirah said we can't allow that because it's going to be unfair. He essentially says that my job will be done. I essentially don't have anything left to do. So Hashem responded to the Yetzirah and said, it doesn't matter what you say. I'm bringing it down. Figure it out to do what you need to do. So the Yetzirah left and came back to Hashem after and said, you can now send down the Neshama. I know what I'm going to do. And the Yetzirah brought back one thing, which is the Machloket. He says, I'm going to try to defeat the Tzaddik by bringing confusion into the world and bringing argument. And you'll see that every Tzaddik that ever came down to the world, there was controversy against any Tzaddik. And so this is why it happens. And it keeps repeating itself. But and we saw it uh, a few weeks before Oman this year. Yeah, of course. There's, blockage, there's always going to be blockages before you do something. Before there's a child that's born, a woman has to go into labor. Before anything is birthed, there always has to be a difficult stage. And so there's the same thing applies not only in the Kabbalah. We learn that also before Bracha comes down, if you study the Zohar and the explanations of how the Bracha comes down into the world or when a new Neshama comes down into the world, it also follows a similar process as an impregnation. It says that the soul impregnates into the Malchut for a few months or up to nine months essentially and then it's eventually birthed into the world. It's the same way that a child is also birthed. The Malchut is feminine, which is why the mother carries the child. There's a lot of reasons for a lot of it. But all of it is to say that it passes through this process. And so now that we understand a little bit of the concept of the despair, the longing, the ratzon, and a little bit of the backstory here, we can now jump into the story of Avram for the first part. Can and I, then after that, we're going to go into the I other parts of it. Yeah. You know, you were making a comment about um, that there is so much um, fight before. You know, someone was telling me that the Tehilim for 400 years were not allowed to be read. Mm -hmm by David Ameller. And everybody today reads the Tehilim, but for 400 years, nobody could read the Tehilim. They thought that it was a sur to read Tehilim. So you imagine in all the big tzaddikim, they went through that. They, which one was it that they wanted to put in? The Ramchal, they, they burnt the books of the Ramchal that mm -hmm. lived about 300 years ago. Um, most of the Ashkenazim in Eastern Europe burnt the books of the, of the Ramchal. The Ramchal was a huge Mekubali, wrote books like Der Hashem, um, he wrote lots of books of Kabbalah. Uh, but now, I mean, now you have Ashkenazim around the world printing the books of the Ramchal. So there was a confusion, obviously. And the confusion is because when there's a lot of light that comes into the world, a lot of people don't accept. The Arizal, when he first came to Tzfat, we are, all the books that we have of the Arizal, which are dozens of books of Kabbalah, and all of it explains the Zohar and the Kabbalah, essentially of Rabbi Shimon Barachai and the teachers before him. He only, everything we have from him is for the last two years of his life. And when he came into the world, and came to Tzfat essentially for the last two years, there was machloket against him. Even his main student wasn't with him um, in the very beginning. And then eventually Rav Khan Vital came to him. There's constant stories of machloket. You could even go back to the times of the Torah. You have Kain and Hevel. You have the stories of Yaakov uh, with his sons that they threw Yosef in the pit. Yosef was a tzaddik, um, right? We call Yosef Yosef a tzaddik. You have Yaakov and Esav. You have Moshe with Korach, the Meraglim. You have endless stories. Um, you have Paro. I mean, like you have endless stories of people countering the tzaddik. So that's just the way that the world essentially works. And now, when essentially we go back to the Torah, and now we can actually understand a little bit of the sequence of what happened whenever Avraham had an interaction with Hashem before he's about to bury Sarah. When Avraham came back down from the mountain and saw his wife was dead, it's written that he essentially started to fall a little bit. Not in Imunah necessarily, but he started to fall into a depression. And he started to fall low. Why? Because he lost his son. He was guaranteed an inheritance. From Hashem, and he lost his wife, which held together the house and all the Torah and all the Muna that he had. We know that Sarah was a huge tzedeket, and at this point, he feels very broken. He almost kind of just drops his hand. He doesn't know what to do. So, we can actually understand a little bit more of the secrets behind this. When he says to Hashem, "I lost Yitzchak," Yitzchak represents the first Jewish child born. Yehudi. It's not really Jewish because we're not Bnei Yisrael yet because it's the father of Yaakov, but. Yitzhak was the first child born out of pure purity. Sarah kept the laws of Nida and Avraham also kept the Ketusha of the Brit. And so Yitzhak was the first Jewish soul that came into the world that was fully pure. And so Yitzhak, through that purity, was able to attain the Torah, the reason why the world came into being. And Yitzhak became a Chacham in the Torah. So when Avraham was saying, I lost Yitzhak to Hashem, and I did the Akedah, and just to explain the Midrash a little bit more, it's essentially that Avraham began to do it 
And a lot of people don't finish the Midrash. So when we understand it, we say he started and the angel stopped him and the tears of the angel poured into Yitzhak's eyes and he became blind. And that's why Yitzhak became blind through the story of the Akedah. But Avraham didn't do the Shrita. Actually, what happened is when, according to the Zohar, when the angel stopped, when the angel stopped him, Avraham needed to do the mitzvah so much for Hashem to feel like he needed to complete the final test that even with the angels trying to stop him, he then recontinued and did the Akedah. And he continued and he did the Akedah. And when the angels saw blood coming from the throat of Yitzchak, they started to cry and that blinded him. And in the three years, it was mending and repairing his body and his soul for what had happened. And then he came back down repaired, but he still had lost the vision. And people think that Sarah passed away according to the Midrash because when the Satan brought her and showed her that Avraham was about to kill Yitzchak, she passed away. That's not actually what killed Sarah. Sarah had such a high level of emunah that when she saw that Avraham hesitated in doing the test, she passed away because she said he's not on the level to finish the test of, do the, of doing the Akedah. And that's how Sarah passed away. But it says that he hesitated? It's, the angel stopped him and he had a hesitation because he didn't understand if he needed to do it or not. And then he continued with it. But at that point, she had passed away because she passed away from hesitation and he continued because he needed it. He wanted to do it because he knew that it was, it was the uh, ultimate will of the test. That's why the Zohar is very sophisticated in it. And it goes very deep, but he needed to do it. And also, the neshama of Yitzhak, the first time, was a neshama of a woman. And it needed to be rectified, mm. to be the neshama of a man, to be with Rivka. Yeah, about the hesitation. David, last week you said that we read that he woke up, yeah. meaning that he slept. And if someone sleeps, he had a, that he, he was fine. No concern, right? He had no concern with it. That's why he wanted to do it. But there was in that small little hesitation that happened, he stopped for a moment, and that moment killed Sarah. All right. So when we'll take a little break in a second, and I'll take a couple of questions if there are some. But just to wrap up this little part before I jump into the next part, which is going to go even a little bit deeper into the story. When Abraham, when Abraham <coughs> came down now, let's, let's get back on track. When Abraham came back now and he said to Hashem with a little bit of despair because he lost the inheritance because we said Yitzchak is the Chochmah because he came out of the purity <coughs> and he studied the Torah. We know Yitzchak never left the land of Israel and he studied Torah all day. Yitzchak was so pure in that sense. And Abraham saw him as the, as the future of the Torah. So when he said, I lost my Chochmah, which is the Nun, Okay, and then he said, I lost my wife, which is Sarah, which is the Dalet. Why? Because the Dalet is compared to the land because the four elements that make up the land and the earth and it's the fourth lowest level, which is the world of Asiya. And it also is compared to the land because we know that Sarah comes from the level of Malchut. Malchut is compared to dust, <coughs> okay, which is also the land. And also, the dust is also an aspect of lowering yourself like we have from the story of David Amelach, to recognize Hashem. So he said, I lost my heart because I lost the connection that I had with the woman that I loved. And I lost my mind because I lost the Torah and I lost the Chochmah. So I don't know how to worship you anymore, Hashem, because I don't know how to solve this question since the beginning of time of how to worship you because I don't have Chochmah and I don't have my heart. So I literally cannot do anything to get close to you. This is the depth of Avram's despair. So now we understand the, the basic of his, the understanding the basic question, which is a lot deeper. And what does Hashem tell him? When he goes home, he sees that the only one that he has left is Yishmael. And Yishmael is what? If you dissect the word Yishmael, it's Hashem heard. Hashem hears you. Right? So what is a word in the Hebrew language that has the same letters that flip Daleds and Nun? Same word, except they just switch Daleds and Nuns. There's a word in the Hebrew language which is hit bonenut, and it changes the nuns to dalit, which is hit bodedut. And hit bonenut is with the mind, which is a meditation where you contemplate God. And hit bodedut with the dalit is wherever you seclude yourself and you completely throw yourself to Hashem, through your words. So now what Hashem was saying to him is now that you lost your mind and that you lost your emunah and you lost your faith in your heart that's at home, he said Hashem is hearing you. So now it's time for you to seclude yourself and enter into Hidbodidut to repair the four. 
But Hashem and Avraham, Avraham didn't see this immediate message from Hashem. That he was essentially introducing the concept of Hibodidut. Because after the 10 tests, now he achieved a level that was so high that he had to reach a level that's the highest of all, which is the Hibodidut. And so to be able to do that, he first didn't see this. So he starts making his way to, Hev to Hebron and eventually meets um, Ephron. And if you look at Ephron's name, it's made up of the letters of Afar, which is the dust. And like we said, that the land is what breeds the will of man. Because like, like Adam Arishon, like we said in the beginning, he put his faith in the, in the land and that's where he gained his Ratzon. So now when he sees Ephron, he starts to see a first hint. And he starts to see, okay, Hashem's giving me something here. First, he talks to me about Ishmael and listening. And I start to understand the concept of being able to speak to Hashem from my despair. But I don't really understand. I now am going to go find a burial plot for Sarah. And then he starts to enter into the concept of dust, which is starting to find a will. Finding a will from nothingness. Now that you're not accepted like the Taf. And then he says again, if you look at it, he says the place in the Torah is called Kiryat Arba, the city of four. Because what? It's a reference again to the four of the building blocks of the world that he's going to build. And the four is what? Is the Dalit. That's why when he finally understood all the pieces, if you look at Ephron, Ephron, he makes a deal with him for how many coins? 400 coins. Right. We're going to get into the secrets of the 400 coins, but four already, you have a four over there to repair the Dalit to do what? Hidbodidut. And at this point, Avram now was able to enter into the space where when he has absolutely nothing, he can now rely on Hashem. When he becomes zero like David and Melech, like the Taf, Hashem will create from there. There's a level that Rabbi Nachman explains that when you do actions in this world, we talked about this earlier with the story of David Melach and the Midrash. If when you do actions in this world, there's direct consequences and there's punishment. And we look at your actions, right? This says that the angels judge and there's Hashem that judges the specific things that are being done. The Zohar goes through different parashiyot and different examples about all that stuff. But there's a level on the highest level, which is the level of Atzilut, which is the complete will of Hashem. And because, and the Zohar also talks about this, the level of Atzilut of Hashem is so high, it's the fourth world, just to be able to explain to people, there's Atzilut, Beria, Yetzira, and Asiya. Asiya is the world that we live in, it's the lowest level. Yetzira is the world of formation, it comes from the world of um, Yotzer, which is like Yotzer Adam, to create the man. And that's the level where there's most of the angels that exist. It's a balance of good and evil. There's good angels, there's bad angels. The world of Beria has some angels, which is the world above it, but it's the level of where the bottom of the Kisei Kavod of Hashem sits. That's where it says that the throne of glory of Hashem sits. That's where all the root of all the Neshamot of Bnei Sal sit. And then you have the world of Atzilut, which is above that, okay? which is essentially the oneness of God. Above that, we enter into the, the concepts of Ein Sof and into the infiniteness of God, which we don't really want to go into and, and explain right now, but just understand the four worlds for right now. On the highest level of Atzilut, it's only wills that exist. Why? Because Hashem is so perfect, He only finds the good in people. And because it's only chesed on that level, and it's only finding that chokhmah and that good within people, that there is no action, because it's only in thought. Meaning that whenever a person, Rabbi Nachman says, wants to do an action in this world, and has a pure thought to be able to do it, even if he's not able to do it, he's judged on the level of Atzilut as if he did it. But in this world, he says, if we live in the world and we enter into the Tumah of the world like, like Avram was going through, and we see the things that we're going through because everybody goes through difficult tests, he says, if you live in the world of Asiya, then when you do an action, you can have a bad thought, but you can show up and put on Tefillin, but they're going to judge you as if you put on Tefillin. But up there, on the highest level, it's almost as if you didn't put on Tefillin because of your will. He says, Rabbi Nachman, when you live in a world of will, and you live only with the concept of your thought is getting closer to Hashem or bringing out the kavod of Hashem, you only live on the world of thought. Only in your will of wanting to believe and be able to create. So for example, if, we, if a person's working on themselves and says, for example, I want to start going to Shacharit with Minyan. So they set an alarm for 6 a.m. and they want to go. But they can't wake up the first few days because it's tough. And they, or they go the first few days and then start falling. Uh, and then... They can't make it, so the alarm rings. Then another day rings the alarm, and he doesn't go. And then another day rings, and then he doesn't go. And then at one point, he turns off the alarm. That's where the Yetzirah beats him. Why? Because the whole reason why the Yetzirah came into the world, like we learned from the story of Rabbi Nachman, is that he does one thing. He tries to remove your will. 
And there's one thing that's brought down in the Kabbalah and the Midrash and Rabbi Nachman says, that it stabs Hashem in the back. He says, you can do any Avera in the world and Hashem will never turn his back on you. He said, there's one thing that Hashem feels like you left him behind. And it's whenever you feel like Hashem gave up on you and you give up on Hashem. He says, the second you give up, he says, there's nothing that causes more pain to Hashem than you saying, I give up. You can do any sin in the book. Like we said in the last class, there's movements up and down, right? People sin, people do better, people sin, people... It's all like this. But the second you flatline is like a person that's dead. So the second you give up is the second that Hashem feels like he's completely lost. That's why for Hashem, when Avram got to the point, he's like, you passed the 10 test. You got to everything. You're at the final stage over here. I'm waiting for you to do it. I'm waiting for you to speak to me now. And at this point, you drop it. He's like, you lost it at almost the very last second. And then from there, he built and he found Ratzon, Avram. That's why... This is one of the most beautiful things. That's why Avram in the eyes of Hashem is he, is he calls him Ohavi. He's my loved one. Because Avram found Hashem in every aspect. So that was just to be able to explain a little bit behind the, the concept of the Ratzon and understanding how on the, thought of, on the idea of thought, Rabbi Nachman would say with the alarm clock, for example, he says for the rest of your life, even if you don't go to Minyan, keep the alarm. Why? Because you have a will to want to wake up. He says, start with that. He says, even if you don't eat kosher, say, I want to start and start there. Whatever your challenge is, wherever you're holding, say to yourself, I want to, if you're a met, if you're really into it, if you don't believe it, then that's something else. Then you have to also dive into that and figure out what makes sense and what makes, doesn't make sense. But if there's something like, for example, you want to start lighting candles on Shabbat and you don't even do Shabbat, but I want to start doing the candles on Shabbat, have a will and have, an, have an, a longing to want to do that. That is the highest place because that's the first creation that Hashem created for Himself to have a will to want to create. So when you have a will to want to create, it's the best way to emulate Hashem in the world. The last story I'll share to share some of the holiness of the Marat Amarpela is a story of Rabbi Avram Azulai, who was one of the ancestors of um, Rabbi Yosef David Azulai, who was the Chida, the massive Mekubah that lived in Israel. Um, of Sephardic descent. And he lived about the end of the uh, 16th century, early 17th century. So like 1570, I think, till 1643, more or less. And there's a famous story about the Sultan of um, the Ottoman Empire, essentially parts of Turkey, that was traveling the world and going to see the famous places in the world. So he wanted to travel to Kiryat Arba and to Marat Amarpela to go see the graves of the Jewish ancestors. So they traveled to Hebron. And when he came, is a famous story that says that he had a sword made of gold and filled with diamonds. What are we doing on time? Okay, cool. So when he came to Marat Amarpela, there's different holes and there's different levels where people are buried. And we know that our Avot and our Imaot, our ancestors, the fathers and the mothers, the matriarchs and the patriarchs are buried there. And there's little caves and little entrances to get into the lower levels to be able to get to their graves. So when he came, he came to the room of where Yitzchak was, and there was a very small hole, and when he bent down to look inside, his sword made completely of gold and diamonds fell inside. And then he started sending people and his soldiers to go. So he called one man, he sent him down, and he heard, this is a story from 500 years ago, he started hearing insane screams. And the guy, they pulled him back up from the rope that they brought him down in, and it was completely black. The guy came out completely dead. They sent another one down, same story, and it kept on happening nonstop. Eventually, it stopped, and he said, I need a solution, I need to get the sword back, figure it out, he told his students. He told uh, one of his, all the soldiers in the army. They said, why don't you bring a Jew? Because if he dies, great. And if he doesn't die, then you get your sword. So he's a win-win. So he said, okay, good idea. So he released in the area of Hebron, which is where Rabbi Avram Azulai was, a notice saying, bring me a Jew to go down into Marat Amarpela. Now the Jews knew that no one enters there because we know that Avram and Sarah technically are still alive and Adam and Chava and stuff. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And that anyone that enters cannot see the face of Adam Arishon because it says that in the Kabbalah that if you see the face of Adam Arishon, you immediately die. That's why sometimes when people, before they pass away, they see the Malach Amavet, and they see essentially the Shechina or they'll see Adam and immediately they pass away. That's what allows their soul to leave their body. And there's a concept in the Zohar that's brought down, I think in Parashat Kitoshim and Emor in the Zohar over there, that talks about the process in which the Malach comes and he essentially unlocks the part in your body 
there's a physical part where there's all the elements that unify themselves and he unlocks all four of them that they're no longer together. And when he completely takes apart that and you see the Shekhinah, you cannot see the Shekhinah and live. So when you see that, it allows your soul to immediately leave your body. And there's a whole process that's explained in the Zohar on that. But a person cannot enter into Ma'at HaMakbala and live. So no Jew wanted to enter into the, into the pit. So they started fasting and waiting many days and praying. And eventually, the massive Mekubal Rabbi Avraham Azulai came out and said, I'm going to go. So he went and they lowered him down. And he said, first, let me allow, to, allow me to do my fasts and allow me to do my stuff. And he dressed in white as if it was Yom Kippur. And he prepared himself to be able to enter into the cave. And when he went down, he came down and it says he saw Avram Avinu. And when he saw Avram Avinu, he said, I'm not going back up. Because he says, I'm 70 something years old. I'm already an old man. Let me stay with you and let's study the Torah for the end of time. And he wanted to stay. And Avram said, you need to go up because if you don't go up, they're going to kill all the Jews in the city. So take the sword, go up. And after, in about seven days, you'll be able to come back and see me. So he said, okay, deal. So he went up and brought him the sword. All of them rejoiced, all of them were happy, all the Jews were saved. And exactly seven days later, he passed away. That's on that. So now I'm going to pivot to a different interpretation on parts of the story of Sarah. And we're going to go a little bit more into the details of the story with Ephron. Okay. Now, I'll give you guys also the option before I get into it. If you guys want me to share some of the stuff on the Arizal and some of the stuff on the Kabbalah, because a lot of it is mathematical. And if people don't want to really go into it, if it's a little deep or something, then we can veer away from it. If not, I'm happy to bring it up and we can, we can share it, but it'll give into the secrets of essentially how special Sarah was and, and the reason for her years and when she passed away and what she did. So I'll let you know in a second when we get there. There's a question that's brought down with Chaye Sarah, why the parasha is called Chaye Sarah and not essentially the passing of Sarah, right? Because she dies in this parasha, but we call it the life of Sarah. And so the Zohar says, just like I just brought up, that this is the first instance where the Zohar introduces the concept that when a person passes away, it's actually the beginning of their life. That's why we light candles, because candles are light forms that can exist, and they're existing, there's oxygen, there's life form in there, and then Tzadikim can inhibit through the candles. We have concepts that we've heard of stories that we see people in dreams, we see, um, we go to um, seeing spirits of people, I'm sure people have heard crazy stories of that as well. But even the Zohar brings up multiple examples, the Zohar, for example, says that in the stories in the Parshiot with Moshe and Devarim, um, Moshe Rabbeinu Lomet, um, it says that Moshe didn't die, and there's a lot of secrets for that, and that's why in the end of the book of Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu um, begs B'nai Israel, in fact, in very simple language, to just keep the Torah and the mitzvot and do what you need to do. The secrets behind that, without doing a whole class, because we did a whole hour and a half class on just that, is because the root of it is that whenever a Jew keeps the Torah and the mitzvot and opens up the book of the Torah, and you read the books and the, par- and the parasha, Moshe comes back to life and reads with you and learns and helps you. And just like all the tzaddikim that come in, they help us to be able to do our tikkunim. Just like angels that can exist throughout time, Hashem gave the capacity to tzaddikim to help out the Jews and help out the people and help out the world throughout all of time. So just as the angels can come back and live and go through back and forth, they do that. So the Zohar uses this opportunity to say that it's not Sarah's death, but it's Sarah's life because this was the beginning of her being able to start helping out the future generations of Jews. All right. There's a famous story of Rabbi Nachman as well. Um... But maybe I'll pass over for that one for right now. And I'll go into maybe some of the stuff on the Arizal. And then maybe we can come back to it. Um, do we want to go into some of that stuff on the Arizal? Or should we, should we skip straight ahead to, to Marat HaMakbila? Yeah? He wants stories of Rabbi Nachman. <laughs> is, everyone, is everyone clear so far on the stuff that we're, we're saying? Does it, make, does it make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so to share a story of Rabbi Nachman to make Karen happy um, Rabbi Nachman at the very end of his life was very famously well known for saying for coming into a room with Rabbi Natan Rabbi Natan was his main student around the age of 37 and a half he came to him and Rabbi Natan saw that he was distressed now Rabbi Nachman in Chaye Moran if you open up and you just read the basic life biography of Rabbi Nachman 
there's sections in there that say that Rabbi Nachman used to repair multiple souls of multiple people that had passed away. He used to have angels that used to, uh, not angels, other souls that were passed away that were in Kilkulim. They used to come into his room when he was in his private quarters and he used to repair Nishamot. They used to ask him for help. He used to be able to go and bid for their favor and do all these different types of Tikkunim that existed in the world. But one day Rabbi Natan saw him and he saw that he was in a lot of distress. So he asked him and he told him, he said, what's wrong? He said, I'm doing too much while I'm alive because he's repairing the souls of the people that are alive in his generation. And he said that it's harder to repair souls of people that are alive than the people that have passed away. And he's repairing thousands of souls that have passed away. So there's so much that he can do with his physical body because he's also suffering through tuberculosis and he's about to die and he's becoming, his body's deteriorating even though he's 37 years old. He then tells Rabbi Nathan, he said, I'm going to be able to do more after my death by the example of the Zohar than, um, than while I'm still alive. And through that, he essentially explains all the concepts of the tzaddikim, how the tzaddikim help us whenever um, we're doing things that we're doing in this world. And people need to understand this. People need to understand that the tzaddikim are mamash up there and you have Rachel Imenu and you have, you have all the avot and all the imaut that are mamash waiting for us to be able to help bring the Mashiach and they're cheering us on and they're helping us out in every way possible. And it's a concept that's very much alive today. It's alive by the concepts of the Kabbalah, but it's 100% true and people need to understand that. And so now to jump a little bit into the Arizal, and we'll see where it goes from here. Um, it says that Sarah was 100, she was 20, and she was 7, right? In breaking out her years. Call, call, uh, call what's called that's outside. It's hard to come inside, no worries. I think it's Sarah. Sarah? Another Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Go Bon, bah, de Sarah, et Sarah is coming in. Voilà. Top. Franck, Dad. Non, papa. You're good, you're good. She went through the back. <laughs> Ça va? Ne t'inquiète pas. We'll catch you up in a minute. So... We're talking about Parashat Chaye Sarah, which is obviously perfect because it's your name. Um, and it says in the beginning of the Parasha when Sarah passed away that she was 100, she was 20, and she was 7. So the language is a little bit weird because like we said, usually a person says 127. The Zohar has a lot of questions about this. The Zohar, the book of the Kabbalah, says that, you know, why is it so special? Why do we even say her name, her age, her um, when she passes away, the location where she was buried? If you look at most of the stories in the Torah, we don't have the name, the location, the burial place of all of them written out. He says, Sarah was very special for this. And part of the answer is going to be brought down by Rabbi Shema Bar Yochai and the in a bit. Rashi says, on a very simple level, that when Sarah was 100, she looked as beautiful as she was 20, and she was as clean as, and as pure as a woman that was 7, or as a child that was 7. That's the simple explanation. Um, the truth is that in there, there's a lot of concepts of renewal that Rabbi Nachman goes into, but I'm going to actually skip over it, which is the heat chachut. For Sarah, she always looked at herself as an opportunity to be able to renew herself. And so it was so renewing to her that even when she was 100, she worshipped Hashem as if she was 20, as if, and when she was 20, she worshipped Hashem as if she was 7. And she looked at herself in every single moment as if she can always be better and always looking back at the other moments to say, I'm going to start new, I'm going to start new, I'm going to start new. So there's a whole concept of heat chachut there, but I'm going to put pause on that because otherwise we can go into too many different aspects. The Arizal says on the 127, and this is where it starts to get a little bit into the Kabbalah, but for those that might enjoy this, in the Kabbalah there's 10 sfirot, and if you work your way down, you have the center sfira, which is keter, then you have Chochmah on the right, you have Bina on the left, you have Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, you have Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and then under Yesod, at the very bottom, you have Malchut. Those are the ten Sefirot. Okay? These act as vessels for Hashem's light, they're manifestations of God, it's the way Baracha travels through the world, it's the way the world was created, it's the way Hashem was manifest um, into the world. And as Hashem diluted himself through the different worlds, you have ten sfirot on the ten world on, on the four different worlds. So you have all these different sfirot and all the energy that's passing through. 
and I know this is a little esoteric, but it's just very basic so people can understand the basic principles of it. Each sphira within itself contains 10 sphirot. And so it can continue to multiply within itself inside. So it's almost infinite. It's almost the infiniteness of God that develops and brings bracha into the world. Okay, so that's a little bit on the introduction of Kabbalah. If you take the 10 sphirot that exists within the 10 sphirot, because we know that Sarah came from the Keter of Malchut, okay, which is the crown, the kingship of the Malchut of the lowest level, which we said, which she was, which was the kingship in this lower level of the world. And she was a queen for that. And that's connected to Afar. It's also the same concept of David Amelech. That's why David Amelech was a king. Um, so what he was saying is that if you take the 10 of the 10, because the Keter of the Malchut, which is one, which is one of the 10 within one of the 10, you have 10 times 10, which equals 100. That's the first 100. So Sarah was 100. The 20 is that she had developed the Chokhmah through developing the mixing of the level of the mind, like we had discussed, there's the mind and the emotions. So you have the Chokhmah and the Bina. That's 10 and 10. So that's 20. And 7 is the 7 lower Sfirot. So this is according to the Kabbalah, the reason why the parasha says Shara was 100, 20 and 7. And she rectified all the levels, which... Not everybody has the opportunity to do in this world. According to the Kabbalah, you start off with your nefesh, which is the lowest level of the soul. You have the nefesh, ruach, neshama. And then outside the body, in the upper levels, you have chaya yechida. So whenever you're repairing the sfirot, if you're repairing the ten sfirot within nefesh, once you repair all of that, then you can do start rectifying of the level of ruach, of your neshama. And then you can rectify neshama. Very few people get to accomplish all of it. Very few people even get to rectify all the parts of nefesh. So this is part of the sophistication. And when we do mitzvot, we bring different lights to different aspects of different things. And whenever you're repairing a mitzvah, a mitzvah can be correcting the netzach of ruach of this, or it could be repairing the limb of this part that you had sinned with. And it corresponds to different parts of the body. And that's why, according to the Kabbalah, a lot of this is very, very complicated. But it's beautiful because, in a sense, everything is interconnected, and this shows the intricacy of how God created the world. So... That was the first on the 127. The beginning word in the parasha is Vayihyu, and it was, right, in the, in the days of Sarah, and then it says her age. If you take the gematria Vayihyu, it was 37. If you do the math, so it's, there's the Vav, which is six, it's the numerical value. The He is five, it's the fifth letter in the alphabet. Um, oh, I skipped the Yud, so there's Vav, Yud, He, the Yud is 10. So far, we're at 21. Okay, then you have another Yud is another 10, at 31, and another Vav is 6, and you're at 37. So that's Vayu, Chai The Arizal then continues and says that if you look at the name of Hashem, and like I said, this is a little bit complicated, but so that people can get a little bit into the Kabbalah, the Arizal says there's different levels of Hashem's name for each world. So of the lowest world, there's the name of Hashem of Ben, which is the Gematra 52. It's the yud Hey vav Hey, but in a permutation that equals 52. And I'll explain in a second. Then on the level above it, you have the yud Hey vav Hey of the level of 45 of, of the name of Hashem. Then on the world of Beria, which is the third level up, you have the name of Hashem of 63. And then you have on the highest level, the name of Hashem of 72, of yud Hey vav Hey. So the way that you get all these other numbers is if you write out yud he vav he in completion. <clears throat> so you write it yud, you spell it out yud vav dalit. And then you spell the he, he, and then this is where the numbers change. <clears throat> he can either be written he aleph or he yud to pronounce it. So in the lower numbers, they're using alephs. And in the upper numbers, that they have higher numbers, they're using yuds in the permutations of God's name. So the level that we're going to focus on with this, to be able to explain the 37 of the beginning of the parasha with Sarah, that it connected to her, is the level of the third level, which is the name of 63. And if you spell it, you'll have, and we can do the math, but if you want to just save the time, yud is written yud vav dalid, which is 20. He is written he aleph, uh, sorry, is written he yud, because it's one of the upper ones, it's the higher counted ones. Then you have, so that's 15. So 15 plus 20, you're at 35. Vav is written Vav Aleph, um, Vav Aleph Vav. So that's 13. So 35 plus 13, we're at 48. And then the last He is He Yud. Okay? So if you add up 48 plus the last 15, you get to 63. 63 of that name, if you take only the hidden letters, 
That's not the yud, that's not the hey, that's not the vav, that's not the hey. So if you subtract 26 from 63, you get 67, uh, you get 37. And so the reference of Sarah, he says, how do you know that this is referencing Sarah from this name of Hashem? Is because Sarah was the first mother. The level of Bina is on the level of Beria, which is on the third world. And because Sarah is Ima, she's one of the mothers, she rectified it on that level. So it corrects that and it says that this is referencing the name of Hashem of this world because Sarah was on that level. This is all according to the Kabbalah. I told you guys it was going to get a little deep. <laughs> yeah, this, so I try to explain it as simply and as easily as possible, but for those that are interested in understanding a little bit of Kabbalah, that was a little bit into it. So the, that, that is a class for another time. Because to understand how she passed all the tests and how she did it, Sarah, in fact, everything that Hashem did, Sarah did with her. Sarah did with, Hashem, with Avram. All the steps and the levels of the Muna, all the tests she had passed with him. In fact, so much to the point that it says that, if you remember, I said that she comes from the Keter of Malchut. Keter is the Sfira, that's the highest Sfira. It corresponds to a crown. If you look at also the letter of the alphabet that corresponds to Keter, is the Chaf. Chaf also spells the word, is used to spell the word Keter. But other than that, if you look at the Chaf, if you actually turn the Chaf and you place it down, it's the shape of a crown that's put on someone's head. And so Sarah had gained the Chaf. That's why, according to the Arizal, if you look at the very beginning of the parasha, there's a small Chaf in the beginning of the parasha. Why? It's one of the only small letters that exists in the Torah. The Arizal said it's because when Sarah passed away, one of the answers is that when she passed away, we lost part of the kingship of her in this world of her being a queen in the world and doing that. Ouais. La même chose. I'll show you the exact word if you guys want. Ça va pas dans ce livre-là, Berkotai, parce que ça, c'est juste Bereshit. Right here. You see the small cup? So in the Torah, in the actual, in the actual Torah scroll, if you actually look at it, You'll see actually a small letter. Right? So people can look at it. En hébreu, ça veut dire, et il a pleuré elle aussi. Pour pleurer Sarah et sa fille. Exactly. Et sa fille. Wow. Exactly. Ça, il écrit en petit. The last thing I'll share, just because we went into the depth of the Kabbalah and the, and the Gematrias and stuff like that, so that people can understand that, and then we'll, we'll finalize by going through the last few secrets on the parasha, and then we'll, we'll take some questions and we can chill or we can, we can do as, as everyone else would like. Um, <clears throat> The last secret that the Arizal brings down to show you the secrets that proves that she comes from this level and this level of rectification is the name of Hashem that corresponds to the Keter of Malchut is the name, is four times the name of Adnut. It's essentially the name of Adonai, which is Aleph Dalit Nun Yud. If you take the name of Adnut and you write it out in factorial of four, so if you write it out as Aleph, Alef Dalet, Alef Dalet Nun, Alef Dalet Nun, and then a Yud. And you do the four variants of it because it's a four letter name. We said the concept of four. She was buried in Kiryat Arba, right? In the world, of, in the city of four. All of it comes back to show that if you run that Gematre, you get to the 126. Plus the Kolel of the name of Adnut, you have 127. So she passed away in completion of this level that she had rectified. That's how the Arizal finalizes this. He goes through a lot of other things and there's the Zohar, but those are some of the little ideas into the secrets behind Sarah and her rectifications in the world and all the stuff that she did. Now to get back to the story, <laughs> to get back to the story, there's a Midrash and there's a Zohar that people need to know so that I can get back to the story. <laughs> so the Zohar says that when the three angels came to visit Avraham in the parasha of last week, when Avraham went, it says there's very bizarre words that it says Avraham ran after one of the oxes or the oxen that were running at the same time that the angels came to visit him. And what happened was, is that the Zohar explains that there was a gate where all the ox were, ke were kept and one of the ox was let out when he opened up the door and it started going somewhere. So Avraham chased it. The Zohar says he chased the ox to where? To Marat Amarpela. Okay, that's the first part. I'm not going to go into the details of the Zohar because it says Avram went inside and what he saw and he saw Adam Arishon and he didn't die because Adam Arishon had the exact same face as Avram because originally Adam and Avram were supposed to be the same. So there's a lot over there. There's a whole story about that. 
But just understand that first he opened up, the Zohar says that there's an ox, went and it went and took him to Ma'at al This is before Sarah was dead, this is before Yitzhak is born. He went there. He lived nearby. Then there's a Midrash that's brought down and says that when Avram was doing the Akedah, he was holding and tied up a goat or uh, I think it was a lamb that was held together. And at the time when he was about to sacrifice the lamb, the Satan came and undid the cord. And when he then was ready to grab it, it then ran away. And then it ran away also somewhere. And where did it run to? It ran away to Ma'at al And now we know that two times is a chazaka. We have like Edim. There's two Edim that makes a testimony. He said, okay, this is very bizarre. It took me twice here. And the same thing happened the second time around. Now he knew at that point, according to the Kabbalah, because the Midrash that we said, we didn't know, Avram didn't know where to bury her, so he was going around and he was looking and then he eventually talked to Efron. That's according to the, the basic levels in the Midrash. The Kabbalah, Avram already understood and he knew that he wanted to bury her there. Because according to the Kabbalah and the Midrash, when he went to pick up the goat and the ox the first time, he smelled Gan Eden, it said. So he said there's something very special about this place. How does he know how it smells? Because there's Sadiqim, and by the way, this is connected to the first class that we did on the month and the other class that we did a couple weeks ago, which is that Sadiqim have rectified their sense of smell because Adam never sinned with the sense of smell. Mm. And so that's why the month of Cheshvan corresponds to the nose, which is also the correspondence of Minashe, we said, which is a rising above the nature, right? And it's the month in the Shevet that corresponds to the thing is Minashe, which is also the same letters as Moshe, but has the Nun, right? Nun is the Chokhmah, the 50th gate. He died on... You know, he died without reaching the 50th gate of, uh, of Bina'a, Avram. So there's a lot of secrets within all of that. But the nose, essentially, Tzadikim have the capacity to, just as Tzadikim can see things that are holy, they can speak things that are holy, they can hear things that are holy, they can experience a world of action and things that are holy, they also have the sense of perfection, according to the Kabbalah, with their nose. So that's why Tzadikim, they can, sometimes they'll go into a space and something will smell bad and they'll know that there's something wrong with the place. And they'll start inspecting it and they'll start looking around until they see something maybe that's wrong. Or they'll know by sense of smell that maybe someone passed away in a home. So there's ways of knowing and it sometimes passes through the sense of smell. Um, but that's why a lot of people discuss this. And there's lots of stories of tzaddikim, in fact, that there's a famous story of Rabbi Nachman. Um, I'll share it so that can. We'll be happy, of course. <laughs> So Rabbi Nachman, one time at the age of 13, at the age of 13, he already started to have followers because he had his bar mitzvah and he got married um, one week after the other, right? And he was a tremendous tzaddik already at the age of 13. It says in Sichot Aran, which are the teachings of Rabbi Nachman and the little conversations that he had with just simple people. It says in lesson seven, not lesson, it's, uh, it's in conversation 76 in Sichot Aran that Rabbi Nachman essentially starts off the lesson and explains to people that at the age of 13, he already knew all the level, all the four levels of Pshat, Ramesh, Drash, and Sod, which is essentially the simplest way of understanding the Torah, the simplest way of understanding the Alakha, the Gemara, and all of the Torah. He already knew it at the age of 13. He already had reviewed it. Um, and he had already done it twice on those four levels. So he knew every Rashi, every Tosfot, and every single Gemara. So he was incredibly learned and incredibly wise. But aside from that, he was an incredibly special soul. And he already knew all the aspects of the Kabbalah. So he even knew the reason why we receive specific mitzvot in this world. To that point. So when he was 13, it was a famous story of his uncle. I believe his name was Rabbi Menashe. And they were all Hasidim under the, under the students of the Baal Shem Tov at the time. But Rabbi Nachman was already very secluded and kind of doing his own thing. He was the type of kid that... Everybody's learning in a Beit Midrash and he's just the only guy that's like dancing around the shul and no one understands what's going on and he's kind of just leaving for four hours and comes back and he's just like as a three-year-old, he was already, you know, going out into the forest and crying to Hashem and doing what David HaMelech is doing. So he's a very special soul. There's a lot of reasons why people are very close to Rabbi Nachman and study his teachings, but this is a little bit. At the age of 13, Rabbi Menashe, because they were all Mekubalim, came up to him and he told him, he said, what level are you holding at in terms of the, ne the Nishamot and the levels of the Tzadikim at your time? So he said... I already passed the Baal Shem Tov at 13. And Rabbi Menashe slapped him across the face because he thought he was lacking kavod. So Rabbi Nachman put his face down and he was embarrassed and then he left. A week or two later, Rabbi Menashe was traveling and he started hearing insane sounds as he was passing through the forest. Crazy sounds. He thought someone was dying. So he started going to try to see if he can help. And as he started getting closer, the sounds started becoming less from chaos and into beautiful song as he was getting closer and closer. And when he got closer, 
it says that he started to smell something that smelled like Gan Eden. That's why I thought of the story. And whenever he got very close, he saw an insane light coming off the face of Rabbi Nachman at the age of 13. And he said, in that moment, I understood why he responded to me that he, was, he already had passed the Baal Shem Tov. He said, because that light that I saw, I've never seen in my life. That's one, that's one little story to be able to understand a little bit of a backdrop on, on Rabbi Nachman. So we understand the Zohar, the ox. We understand the Midrash, that one of the lambs that had gone. And now we go back to the story of Ephron. When Avram came to Ephron, remember he had all these types of images and he had the Hidbodidut concept and he's trying to find Hashem. He had this despair, he falls and, he, and he's still trying to figure it out. So we had the basic story in the parasha, but we're trying to get into the secrets behind why all of this is happening. What happened with Sarah? What happened with Avram? What are all these tests? Why is it happening to him? And he comes in front and like we said, remember we said Ephron is like Afar. There's a very big Hasid and Mekubal from Poland. I don't have his name, but he writes in one of his books. He says, why does the Torah give us the name of the father of Ephron? Irrelevant. We know that the Torah doesn't give us names of random people. He's not specifically a holy person. If one is not at all a good person. Um, so why is it even giving us his father's name? It's completely unnecessary. So his name is called um, Tzachar, I think, in the parasha. Right? It's Tzadichet Resh. And he says, why do we have that name? He says, because if you write, if you rearrange the letters of Tzachar, you have Rotzeach, which is a person that's trying to kill. And we said that Ephron, this is now according to the Kabbalah, and now going back into the, into the understanding behind the secrets of the story and how Avram is coming to Ephron. Avram first shows up, and he shows up in the area, and he's talking to the people in the, in the areas of Hebron, and he's talking to the Bnei Chet, and he tells them whether you accept me as a ger or a toshav, essentially as a foreigner, even though I've been living here for a few years, accept me as a ger or accept me as a toshav. That's pshat. I want to bury my wife here. So all of them are like, of course, you're one of us. And they accept him like a toshav, like a person that's a resident. So at first we think that's great. The Kabbalah is going to explain to you why Avram knew that this was fishy business, right? And then he gets to Ephron, and we have the name of Ephron. Ephron by himself, if you take the value of Ain Pe Resh Nun, is gematria 400. Ain Ara is gematria 400. So when Avram now met with Ephron, and now he's starting to see all these signs. He has the falling from Yitzchak. He has the falling from, from Sarah. He's now going to bury Sarah. And he's starting to see all these things. Ephron is afar. He's starting to see that he needs to build a will. Why? Because he's starting to see this. Now the Aizal and the Zohar explain that Sarah, actually, um, Sarah, when she was rectifying something very special that existed at that time, Sarah, in fact, was actually a Gilgul of Chava, the wife of Adam and Hashan. That's why she had to be buried there also. And that's why she had a connection to the location. The reason why, and now it's going to be explained all through the secrets of the story. Avram, by the way, we said Ephron was 400, Ainara is 400. Avram gave 400 coins to combat the Ainara, the Ainara of Ephron. But we know that also, Ephron in the beginning of the story tried to give the land to Avram for free. So we don't really understand why that is, but Avram immediately said no. Rashi says a very simple explanation is because he needed to do a kinyan. He needed to do an acquisition. So if he didn't accept it and he accepted it for free, in future years, they could come and say it's not yours. So he needed to do a transaction to guarantee the land. That's the simple understanding. We always accept the simple understanding. But the question is, how is essentially Avram continuing through all of these tests? Why is Hashem continuing to test him through all these things? Didn't he pass these 10 tests? And... Within this, right, there is a midrash that's brought down in a similar midrash that says that 10 times in the Torah is written the name Bnei Chet. Bnei Chet, by the way, the, er the people that lived in the area are the sons of sin, right? And what sin? It's eventually going to come back to the sin of Adam Aishon. And that's why Sarah had to go there because Sarah was actually correcting Chava. And Chava sinned with the snake. And the snake has the same Lashon that's used with... Um, with um, Ephron in the parasha. And so when Sarah came there, she was able to do a rectification of Chava because Chava had sinned with the snake. And this was all a rectification to be able to come back on to do this. But in order to be able to do that, the Midrash essentially says that the 10 times you see the word Bnei Chet corresponds to the 10 times that we have the 10 sayings in the Torah, meaning that, um, oh no, actually the 10 commandments the Ten Commandments that Hashem gave. And it's essentially a rectification for the ten times of those sins. That's why Avraham had ten tests. There's a lot of parallels of ten. There's also 
Um, Rabbi Nachman brings down in lesson 78 of book 2, a very famous lesson, which is the lesson that says, In shum ba'olam klal. So remember in the very beginning of the class, we started off by talking about the fact that there's despair. And if you see that when the world was created and when all these things happen, you see constant stories of despair, of lowering oneself. You have the story with the letter Taf. You have all this story of Sarah, Avram. Avram comes down after the Akedah and he kind of turns around and he says, you know, I'm despairing in front of you, Hashem. So in that lesson, that lesson was brought about because... Rabbi Nachman revealed that lesson. Um, I'll actually come back to that after at the very end because I want to be respectful of people's time and I don't want to go overboard on it. But just know that lesson 78 of book two talks about where Rabbi Nachman reveals to everybody that there isn't a worry in the world at all. In Yehush Ba'ulam Klal is essentially Rabbi Nachman telling all his students don't despair in the world. And like I said in the first story with the Yetzirah, Rabbi Nachman came into the world to teach his students that no matter how far you go, no matter how low you drop, don't ever have any despair because you can always rise above all your sins and everything that you've done. Just don't lose your will. Because the second you lose your will and the second you lose your heart and the purity of wanting to get close to Hashem is the second that the Yetzirah essentially wins. It's like the story with the alarm clock. Right? And so... Rabbi Nachman brings down in a second lesson, in lesson 12 of book 2, the lesson of Ayeh. Ayeh is essentially wherever you say, where are you, Hashem? And in Musaf and in the holidays, we read Musaf of Shabbat and the different Chagim. We say, Ayeh makom kevodol haritzo. It's a very special time in the, in, the, in the tefillah. It's in fact such a holy time that all the Mekubalim have special kavanot during that specific meditation that happens at that time. And... It's known that if you have special meditations in that time, you can have a lot of different tefillot that are answered. And all the words essentially come down because what you're really doing is that in that lesson, it goes through a lot of different details. It's a very long lesson, but the short version is, is that everything that you have to do is to be able to find Hashem's glory in the world. And what Rabbi Nachman says is that everything that Hashem created in the world, because in that lesson, he says that there's 10 Ma'amarot um, that Hashem created the world with We know that the world was created with 10 different sayings He says that those 10 different sayings Were brought into the world Only to be able to bring Hashem's kavod Into the world more and more And what Rabbi Nachman is saying is that Avraham had to repair this And every single one of the tests of Avraham Is that he had to continuously find Hashem In everything that he had to do And that's how you find the ayeh in every single moment Of every single one of his lessons So Rabbi Nachman is starting to tell you There is no despair when you learn that from a different lesson once you understand that concept and you understand the Midrashim and you understand David Melach and you understand all the other things that are happening and you understand that there isn't a worry in the world and you know to search for Hashem even in the lowest pits that you'll enter, now you have the tools to be able to understand the tests of what Abraham had. And essentially, when Hashem gave Avram this opportunity and he kind of came down with despair and Avraham himself fell into this darkness, right? The same type of question that we would ask ourselves. We would essentially say to ourselves, how do we serve Hashem and why do we, how do we find Hashem in this filth? Like how do we find Hashem in this darkness, right? The answer is actually brought about by Rabbi Nachman explaining that in the Zohar and in the Midrashim that say that there's the 10 Ma'amarot in the beginning of the world. When Hashem created the world, it says Vayomer this and Vayomer that. He says there's actually nine. And the Zohar gives an answer and says that there's actually the word Bereshit. Bereshit is considered a Vayomer. Why? Because that is one of the first creations of the world that in the beginning he created. And that's one of the first that he did. He said, but Bereshit is hidden. So you have nine and you have one hidden. Okay? And there's this concept of getting into the hidden. That Hashem is trying to teach Avraham in understanding the concept of Ayeh, understanding the Dalid of the Kriyat Abba and the 400s and all the 4s. And Avram is trying to recognize the concept of now trying to do Hit Bodedut. And he's trying to find Hashem. So he's saying, where are you? In fact, when people get into despair and they fall into places of depression, their first thing is like, where were you in my life, Hashem? What is going on? Why are you not doing this? And Hashem's trying to get Avram into this, into this space to understand this concept. Funny enough, if you look at the Bnei Chet, there's also B'nei Chet written nine times in the Torah. And one time it says Ame'aretz, like the people of the land. And that's also hidden. And all of that is to be able to be brought down so that now when you understand that these are people of the land and these are people that come from the original sin and these are people that come from the snake that were essentially born out of the first sin of Chava that Sarah was trying to repair. When Avram now goes to this land 
and he sees all of this and he's trying to see Hashem and he's trying to find Hashem and he's essentially saying, Aye, where are you? Because I entered and I asked him if I was going to be a ger or toshav. But I know that they're from the side of the snake and the sitra achra and the evil side in the world and they're going to test me. And after I fall and after I lost Yitzchak and after I lost Sa'a, now you're sending me this. He said, I thought I'm done with my 10 tests. And the Zohar says, why 10? Is, does it continue? Does it not? Rabbi Natan answers in Likut al that every single test, like I said, was for the point of Avram being able to say Aye. And that corresponds to the 10 Ma'amarot, of finding Hashem in the hidden. So now when Avram eventually comes here and he sees them and they says, you're like us, you're like us, don't worry, we're going to help you find the land, don't worry. And he tries to give it to him. <clears throat> he says, don't speak to me like, he essentially tells them, don't consider me like I'm like one of you because I'm not like one of you. I don't want to be like the people that sinned. I don't want to fall. I want to find a will to be able to come back to Hashem. And then when he meets Ephron, <coughs> Ephron essentially tells him, I'll give you the plot of land for free. Now, if you remember, we said from the Chidush and the Kabbalah that Ephron's father was written because it was a reference towards murder and killing. Ephron, according to the Midrash, every time Ephron would go by the place, he had, he had thoughts of someone wanting to kill him. And he always thought someone was going to die. Anytime someone entered into Marat al someone died. So he didn't tell anyone, but he wanted to get rid of the land. So he was dying to get rid of it, but he didn't tell anyone anything. But when Avram came, he's like, here, take it for free, because Avram was a well-known man, and he was a negotiator, and he wanted to try to take some money from him and try to pull a fast one on Avram. But Avram didn't care, because Avram had all the money in the world. He knew he needed to be there, because Avram, according to the Zohar, knew that that's the place where Sarah needs to be. In fact, according to the Kabbalah, after he bought the land, and he entered into the land, and he entered into the cave, and buried Sarah, he found the entrance of Gan Eden. And according to the Kabbalah, that's where the lower Gan Eden is entered. You can enter to the lower Gan Eden through there, through the steps in the Ma'arat HaMachbila. So that's when he realized that. But before that, you have him trying to give it to you for free. But what else happened for free in the Tikkunim that happened many generations before? You had the snake that told Chava to eat from the tree because it was free. And so when, Ad, when, Adam, when Avram saw this, he said, we're not falling for the same trick again. So he said, no, I want to pay for it and I want to own it completely. And he said, what? I also want the land and the trees around, not just the place. And this is the secret behind why he asked for everything. And he bought it with 400. Because 400 was to defeat the Ainara and to defeat the snake and to essentially bring it back in. And Ain is also the Ay. And according to the Kabbalah, the snake sinned and allowed seed to be able to leave its body through its eye whenever it sinned with Sarah. And that's why he returned it back to him and he brought it to him by the same way that it was granted. And that's the correction that he was doing according to the Kabbalah of Avraham. So all of this is brought in to essentially repair and show that even through the darkest teachings and darkest places that a person goes, what Hashem was actually bringing Avraham to was a place of where he was able to find him. Eventually Yitzchak was able to come back. And obviously Avram lived with Yitzchak and eventually he sends Eliezer to be able to find Rivka and he's able to then complete the Tikkunim and the stuff that exists. But this is the first time in the Torah where we see the concept according to Rabbi Nachman of Hidbodidut and being able to see Avram cry out to Hashem from the darkest places that he was. So that's the class. Within the lesson um, 78 of book two, there's the whole story of despair and how Rabbi Nachman had entered into despair. But I'll keep that for after and whoever wants to maybe stay for that a little bit later. Um, but within that, there's a lot of secrets of how Rabbi Nachman revealed that lesson and why that lesson is understood so that people understand that Avram had to find his will even though he had lost everything at that point. And then he digs down deep enough within his heart to be able to come back to Hashem. So, Bezrat Hashem. Through the teachings of these tzaddikim and through obviously the mystical teachings of the Kabbalah and the Arizal and the Zohar and the Midrashim, may we have the opportunity to not just to read the parasha and see things and think that it's a very basic story or something that we don't really understand, but through working on ourselves, Avraham went through this just like we go through this every single day. We wake up and we're tested, not on this type of a level, but everybody goes through problems and everybody goes through difficult things. And so it's very important that when Rabbi Nachman came into this world, he essentially taught people that you should never ever despair and you should understand that Hashem wants you back no matter what. Even if a person falls and a person sins on the level of Atsilut, on the highest level, Hashem is always looking at you as your intention of, okay, you fell, you sinned, so what? Rabbi Nachman says that when a person sins, he does two sins. He does the sin itself 
and then he has a depression after he sins. He says, at least if you sin, okay, you sinned. Get up and get happy and get going back to Hashem and get close to Hashem again. Not like that you sin and you don't care. But he says, if you fall into depression, then the Yetzirah won. But if you sin and you fall and you're coming back and you're working, then you're just human. And if you're like David HaMelech, which you can eventually attain the level, then you can reach a level where you say, Hashem, the sin wasn't even me. It was you that gave me the sin. And then you could say, I'm not even taking the sin with me to the grave after. He says, I only want to be with you. So you make it that everything that I do and everything that I do is to be with you, Hashem. And I don't want to sin and I don't want to fall. I just want to live with you. I just want to be happy. I want the bracha and I want to live with everyone else and I want to see you in every single aspect of this world. Rabbi Nachman says that we should get to a point that our hand doesn't move even an inch unless we ask ourselves, are we doing something that's bringing the kavod of Hashem into the world? It's a very high level, obviously. But the point of it is that this is the level in which he lived. If he was doing a bracha, for example, if he did shakol and he drank, and then he wanted to drink again, he already did shakol. So he had a purpose. The question is, am I bringing kavod of Hashem into the world if I drink again right now? And if he didn't get to a conclusion that he was bringing the kavod of Hashem into drinking again, he wouldn't drink. I mean, this is a, an extreme example, but we have this in so many things that we do in life that we wake up and we get overwhelmed, right? We had the parasha of the mabul with Noah. There's so many things that overwhelm every single person. Everybody goes through distress. Everybody goes through problems. But the beauty of understanding that the will was the first creation, that everybody has to tap into their will. The will is something that everybody has. There is no person that doesn't have will. The question is, how much will do you want? And by the way, this applies also in material and business. You see that people that succeed, you'll see sometimes there's people that you meet that they just have an insane will. Like they're willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. And there's other people that have less will. And you'll notice that a person that's in depression has zero will. And the point of getting out of depression is to try to find a little bit of will, try to find a little bit of happiness to get out of there. So when you see someone that's depressed, it's all about being able to find a space where the person can move a little bit. They don't want to go to the gym. They don't want to eat. They don't want to do anything. Just do a little something, a little something. Create a little will. And from that little will, from that dust, from that little seed that you plant, everything grows from there. And that's where it kills. And then there's lessons of Azamra, which is the lesson of I will sing because I found a good point. And when you find a good point, then you start finding other good points. And then you start to build on that. The beauty of all of it is to come back in this. So Bezrat Hashem, may we renew ourselves and find within ourselves the good points. May we always find and look for the good points in other people. May we try to do everything that we can to be able to speak to Hashem. You know, the practice of Hidbodidut is remarkable. Just being able to sit in a room for five minutes and start with one minute and just be able to speak to Hashem, it's the only thing that Hashem wants. It's the highest level. It's literally the point of where Avram got to that Hashem was bringing him to after 10 tests. So imagine the level of where it was. And Bezrat Hashem, may we have the will to have a true will to want to get close to Hashem and bring the Mashiach. Amen. 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 Amen.